All right. Thank you for attending another session of the Higher Education History Symposium. Again, I'm Dr. Anthony Edwards, instructor for higher education history. And our next presentation is on the history of trade schools. So group, take it away. Hi, good evening. Uh, we are doing the history of trade schools. Um, our group members are Ariana, Miles, myself, Kristen Ames Guest, Haley Young, and Daniel Savarisi. Did I hopefully I pronounced that correctly? Um, so we're gonna begin with the introduction statement. Okay. Um, yeah, so like she said, we are gonna be covering the history of trade schools. Um, looking at the past, present, and future um, of trade schools through literary reviews, observational insights, best practices, and interviews. Um, by looking at the history of uh, trade schools and technical colleges, we can understand um, how these institutions play a role in the world of higher education and in our uh, ever-growing and expanding society and uh, um, demand. So starting with the literature we researched about technical colleges, um, first we noticed that um, through the textbook for this course, we noticed that training for specific careers was initially tied to religion. Um, and they primarily focused on preparing young men um, for positions in the church or other skilled trades. During this time um, or during this foundational period of higher education, we noticed that there was a debate between classical education and vocational training, um, basically deciding which of the two is more essential to workforce readiness. And then finally, we noticed that with the with societal changes like industrialization, that also helped for technical education, technical colleges to expand. When we think about influential figures, um, there was Johann Pestalozzi, who was the first to advocate for hands-on practical learning experiences. So learning through discovery, um, sensory activities, things like that. Um, and that philosophy kind of was, uh, that philosophy contributed to the establishment of technical schools. So one of our nation's first technical colleges was Ohio Mechanics Institute in 1828. And that college primarily focused on engineering and technology um, and as we know, as those two fields grew, that continually see help shape the um, landscape of technical education. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, when we think about where technical colleges are today, um, we know that there are CTE, so career and uh, technical education programs in fields like agriculture, construction, welding, um, a variety of others, and they're also built into high school curriculum. So those programs are built into those high school curriculums to help prepare students for immediate workforce entry. Um, basically, those programs help enhance their employability once they've graduated high school, and we're noticing that there's an increase in recognition of those programs as valuable paths um, after high school. Um, as you know, we are living in the digital age, um, and as that technology continues to develop, so does the integration into our education. Um, and more specifically, there is a high demand in those fields like cybersecurity, data analysis, um, digital marketing, things like that. And specifically, the partnerships um, with tech companies and technical colleges, they allow for that cutting edge those cutting edge skills um, and tools to be integrated into those programs so that students are employable and ready to work in tech driven fields. Finally, as we think about what is to come in technical colleges, um, first we have to address the challenges and critiques that they faced. So specifically, um, there are some critiques that say technical colleges, they are too narrowly focused on the technical expertise of the trade and there isn't much development of soft skills. And as we know, those skills are required for moving up or career advancement. So they kind of, or the lack of those programs or the lack of those courses, um, prevent students from achieving leadership or managerial roles. Another critique mentioned or highlighted was that during the COVID-19 pandemic, that exposed gaps in learning um, where colleges or technical colleges had to quickly transition hands-on experiences into a digital platform, which obviously wasn't easy. But since then, that has prompted them to kind of like think about how they're able to maintain flexibility and accessibility even through times of crises. 
Finally, as we think about the future of technical colleges, we believe that uh, they are poised for growth um, as skilled workers are more in demand in various industries and that the popularity of these technical colleges will increase as the value of traditional four-year degrees are reassessed. Um, And also through our research, we notice that they are beginning to incorporate courses about leadership, communication, and um, other interpersonal skills to bridge that gap. And I'll pass it on to Kristen for observation insights. It happened last time. Um, this isn't me. This is, I think this is Haley. Oh. That's okay. Uh, no, it's, it's actually me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, observational insights. So we looked at um, uh, three technical uh, colleges um, and analyzed some of their history and how they impact their students. Um, the first one that we looked at was Western Tech, which was founded in 1970. Um, the school offers a wide variety of programs and opportunities for students to get a, um, a CDL certification. Um, it offers hands-on learning opportunities and a variety of courses that help students uh, adapt and be ready and prepared for the working force and what roles they want to play in the working force. Um, the second uh, institution we looked at was Lincoln Technical College, um, which started as a trade school in 1946 um, help, um, to help soldiers that were returning from World War II adapt and um, find jobs um, uh, with a uh, special emphasis on uh, automobile, on the automobile, in- automobile industry that was um, starting to grow and expand around that time. Um, today, it offers fields in automobile technology culinary and has faculty and staff that are dedicated to helping their students succeed and excel in their programs. Um, uh, The last uh, college that we observed was Texas State Technical College, um, which was founded in 1969, um, is is, is dedicated to providing students with the technical skills needed um, as technology grows and expands into a digitalized economy. Uh, We've noticed that uh, with the observations that we observe from these universities and looking at employers, um, that they are interested in hiring students um, from technical colleges um, or trade schools due to their high learning level in that field, um, in that area that they sought uh, education from. Um, And it it helps them move more into management positions and um, areas of uh, higher up in their working field um, at, t- at, TC, at TSTC, um, we found that there was a strong online learning hybrid um, for online learning opportunities with within the digitalized media. Okay, so for best practices, I focused on three specific um, trade institutions, colleges, um, whichever. So the first one I have is the Tennessee College of Applied Technology or TCAT, I guess. Um, This one is focused on their employer integrated apprenticeship program. So their objective for this program was to increase job placement rates and ensure students graduated with practical real world skills that were aligned with industry standards. So they launched this program to prepare their students for, you know, more common trades like welding, HVAC, electrical technology, um, different programs of that sort that usually require an apprenticeship before you are technically certified in the industry. Um, The program combines classroom and instruction with hands-on training that's provided directly on the job and in collaboration with local businesses and employers. So they have, you know, different parts of industry partnerships, work-based learning, um, mentorship aspects, and credential alignment. Their outcomes that over 95% of students secured employment within their field upon graduation Um, Participating employers reported higher retention and satisfaction with graduates and students graduate graduate sorry debt free um, since their apprenticeships often include tuition reimbursement. 
Back to TSTC, like Daniel was talking about, they have performance-based, they, whoa, have a performance-based funding model. Um, This objective is to align educational outcomes with workforce needs and incentivize job placement for students in technical fields. Um, TSTC operates under a unique performance-based funding model where state funding is tied directly to the earnings of its graduates. This creates a strong incentive for the college to focus on high demand trades and ensure students are job ready. They have very strong industry connections, um, career oriented curriculum, job placement services, technology and equipment, and graduate earnings trackings. The outcome of this was that TSTC boasts employment rates consistently above 90 percent in many of its programs. Employers frequently report that TSTC graduates are among the best prepared workers that they hire, and students experience significant earning increases compared to their peers who did not attend CSTC. Then we have the Lamar Institute of Technology and their fast track workforce training programs. Um, The objective of this is to rapidly train and certify students for high demand technical jobs in the region, reducing unemployment and addressing industry skill gaps. So the Lamar Institute of Technology developed this program to provide accelerated training to students seeking immediate employment in high demand fields like process technology, industrial maintenance, and healthcare. These programs are designed in close collaboration with local industries and cater to both recent high school graduates and adult learners. They have accelerated training, industry-driven curriculum, um, certification and licensing, employer partnerships, and support services. Their outcomes are that many students secure employment within weeks of completing the program, often with starting wages above the regional out average. Students benefit from low cost or grant funded training, making programs accessible to underserved populations. And partner companies report significant reductions in hiring and training costs due to the job readiness of LIT graduates. I thought that this part of the presentation was very interesting because while the programs are different in their own ways and kind of custom to their area and the trade institution, um, they all kind of have the same outcomes and the same principles. So obviously something's working there and it seems to be working very well for these three. Okay, so now on to the interview insights with our experts. Experts. We interviewed um, two people from TSCC and then someone from a different trade school um, from the Precision Welding um, outside of Katy, Texas. So the first question that was asked was about the history of the institution. Um, TSTC was originally a part of the a and system, which I didn't know that. And then they kind of branched off and then they continued to branch and then they decided to come back together as one. So they have 12 different campuses statewide. They've adapted to new industries, providing technical solutions. Um, So that was that was really interesting. The precision welding was established in 2019. It's relatively new, but it um, they do the FAFSA funding and all of that. It was funded by, it was founded by Scott Rabb. Um, He addresses the gaps in traditional welding education. He just realized that where he was working, he wasn't getting the education um, that would propel him into the workforce. So he wanted to change it. So he created his own trade school and it's doing really, really well. Um, The next question is about the history of their expert areas in general, Um, Bonnie who is at TSTC, she taught um, AutoCAD. And then we have our welding aspect. Um, AutoCAD, they do all kinds of things. They, from from designing vehicles to houses to welding, it's a very essential skill in the trade. And then there's welding, which is quite vital for building, especially in our area with all this new construction. Um, Career services at TSTC, the history is they've, unified their campuses. 
they realized that they were all doing, they were doing the big things all together, but the smaller things, it was becoming more person procedures and not like campus procedures. And so I found it really interesting in all the interviews that the people would leave and take all that knowledge with them. So they were realizing this was kind of a systematic issue and TSC had, TSTC adjusted and made it one procedure for all 12 campuses under one accreditation. Um, how does the history of your institute relate to your current work and role? Some of the key changes is unified the campuses under one accreditation, shift the focus from enrollment driven to placement driven. Um, someone mentioned earlier about the funding that's unique to TSTC. Um, a lot in the precision welding place, they really work really close with um, people in the industries to make sure that they are developing those soft skills and uh, getting the certifications needed to push them into the workforce um, almost immediately. Uh, the lessons in history, the, the institutional unification, the honoring the past practices, you need to know where you've been so you don't repeat the errors from your his, from your past. Um, oh, this is covering it up. I can't read that question. Uh, something, the type of institutions are important. The key, the importance of knowing your institutional history, I just mentioned that. Um, understanding your roots, revealing how institutions like TSTC um, evolve to meet workforce needs, they're fostering pride and responsibility. Um, this is something that uh, Wyatt Nations from Precision Welding, he talked about that there's a huge trade gap between um, people going into the trades. Right now, there's like over 100,000 job deficits for the trades. And a lot of those older men who knew how to do these things and do it really well, they're retiring and you know, there's a legacy there that's kind of um, a lot of the younger generations are missing out on. Um, empowering collaboration, promoting a one team culture, um, shaping the future, connecting the past and the present. Um, what recommendations do we have? Um, commit fully to what you wanna do. Um, understanding the, econo the economy. This one was really interesting. Um, I can't remember who mentioned it. I think it was the vice president, but she was talking about understanding the economic need in your region. That was really interesting to me because I had never thought of it in those terms. So East Texas needs are going to be a lot different than Central Texas. We're in an economic boom and we're under construction. So we need all the electricians. We need the plumbers. Um, versus down in South Texas where they're not seeing that kind of growth. They need a completely different trade. So for trade schools to have that adaptability and be able to realize that that's what they need and they can pivot, that's something that they really um, work constantly at. Also promoting growth and value the technical education. Um, any add-ons that they that they wanted to add, um, understanding the dual perspectives of, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the people going into this have a family and they're working full time and they're, they're trying to get these trades and just the unique perspective that they bring, um, a value of skilled trades with a growing shortage of welders and skilled tradesmen. There's an urgent need to preserve that craftsmanship, uh, regional awareness, fast paced environment because of, you know, increased um, technology and everything's changing. The industry standards are constantly changing. Um, so the trade schools have to be real fast paced environment to be able to keep up with the changing needs of our economies and to provide career services and education. And these are our, and our conclusion. So some key takeaways from our presentation that I took were kind of like your success in technical education. It requires discipline, motivation, adaptability. We were heavy on that one. Uh, I personally, just in real life, think that adaptability is one of the best qualities that you can have. Um, 
change is scary, but change is everywhere and it's coming at all times. Um, you need to build partnerships with donors, employers, and other departments um, and expand opportunities for students. So as somebody that works in, you know, higher education, you have to be able to have those connections to provide to your students. But as a student, you want to have those connections to provide for yourself. Um, understanding regional industry demands and aligning curriculum ensures placement driven success. Um, ensuring that you have all the right certifications, um, how, um, TCAT talked about their intern or sorry, apprenticeship, um, you are going in and you're doing your apprenticeship while you're still getting, um, your degree. That way, most of the work is done once you have gotten your degree and you are out of school, uh, cuts the time in half. Recognizing the value scale of skilled trades is essential and industries face shortages of well as industries face shortages of welders and other tradesmen um we have a shortage of almost every trade that there is um including education there's a major shortage of teachers right now so promoting these technical colleges as much as we can and adapting them to be the best that they can be and give their students the best education um, is kind of, I think, the best way to get there, the best way to avoid these deficits and these drops in, in employment. That way, it's not older folks telling, you know, the younger generation, oh, don't do that. It's a terrible industry to be in. We make it better and we're growing every day. There are, there are references. references. Sorry, I was muted. No. Um, any, any questions? I have one. Um, can you see a point, you know, with, with technology and everything today where we, you know, uh, school systems, for example, the AM system were to incorporate more technical schools into their system in general? where they have all the different levels under one umbrella Yeah, so uh, in multiple locations. It's interesting you asked that question. Um, I was doing my, the, the paper we had to do over uh, the webinar and they were taking, talking about, oh, the maker's challenge. The, and it's where the four-year universities are partnering with the two-year universities to help create like a maker space to to encourage um, to encourage the use of the three D printers and to encourage the AutoCAD stuff and to help kind of change the stigma of trade schools um, so that it it doesn't look like, like it's just someone to pick up a wrench you know that that negative stigma it was they're actually partnering with it to help boost some of these uh, absentees in our work field economy. To add on to that, you mentioned the AM system, and AM is like directly partnered with Blinn. And so they have two locations. There's one that's in Bryan and there's one that's in Brenham. And I think that if AM continued to push Blinn to improve their courses and kind of broaden their horizons in terms of what classes are offered and what certifications are offered, that being attached to the Texas A&M name would boost it in and of itself. I think it also kind of depends on where like changes in technology and um, like the automobile industry changing and stuff like with the invention of electric cars, that is a different need than a regular gas car. So adapting to different um, work environments and what, uh, the demand and needs are of uh, our current society will also impact whether or not universities such as uh, big school universities like a m partner with more trade schools or not one thing i will add to this conversation if we look at it broadly i know uh in texas we have the you know texas education agency texas higher education coordinating board and texas workforce commission 
and they have essentially created what, like this tri agency commission or, or council, and they are starting to talk to each other. And so that is it's kind of a big deal because, you know, historically they've operated completely independently. And so there's starting to be more interaction. Uh, also, I know with Lamar, you know, university, you also have Lamar Institute of Technology. And so that that's kind of unique in, in Texas. We don't really do that a lot. We look at Arkansas, University of Arkansas system. They've got community colleges and universities and in, in within the University of Arkansas system. Um, and so uh, everybody does it a little differently. Uh, you know, way we do community colleges in Texas, they're kind of locally, you know, owned and run, if that makes sense. Uh, there are other states where all the community colleges are all sort of part of a state consortium and they're essentially state level. They're not funded with local dollars or funded, funded with state dollars. So it just really depends also on kind of how things are organized. Uh, there's, from a policy standpoint, there's all, there's, I would say there's a lot of things on the table with the next legislative session. We'll just have to see how it all plays out. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, interest in educational reform. So I will say that much. Uh, but great question. Any other questions? Well, hearing none, I want to, uh, to say thank you all for doing a great job and talking about technical colleges. They're, obviously, they're an important part of our uh, state's workforce development plan. And so I uh, appreciate all that you have done in this presentation.